We're in Sintra, Portugal, for this year's ECB Forum on Central Banking. It's our biggest event of the year, where central bankers, academics and financial market participants from across the world meet to discuss policy issues and the world economy. This year's theme is monetary policy in an era of transformation. And one factor with enormous potential to transform our economies, for better or worse, is geopolitics. Right now, geopolitical risk is higher than we've known for a long time, with diplomatic tensions turning into military conflicts, including in Europe. And while most news is rightly focused on the tragedies that war brings to ordinary people, the current risks are also highly relevant to economic policymakers such as central bankers. You're listening to the ECB podcast, bringing you insights into the world of economics and central banking. My name is Paul Gordon, and I'm joined by Moritz Schulerich, who is president of the Kiel Institute for the World Economy. Moritz, welcome to Sintra. Thanks for having me, Paul. Now, as I note, uh, recent years have highlighted uh, a lot of the issues that are going on in the world um, that are having a geopolitical impact on the economy. Uh, here in Europe, obviously, Russia is unjustified. Um, invasion of Ukraine, the consequences this has had for the EU area have been felt by many ordinary people, at least indirectly. Let's start with the broad geopolitical landscape. How do you see it at the moment? Well, the world economy really has changed. We are no longer in that uh, belief that globalization is both a force for efficiency and peace and stability. We have a globalized, integrated economy, but uh, there's certainly tensions and conflicts are back. Uh, the world isn't more stable uh, than it used to be. It, you know, on the contrary, we've seen rising tensions, both a rivalry between the U.S. and China, uh, and also, uh, you mentioned it, Paul, the, uh, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. So uh, war is uh, back in Europe, and we're thinking hard, uh, uh, researchers, policymakers, about uh, the economic tools and ways we have to uh, navigate this new landscape. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've also got the Middle East um, conflict there, Gaza, but also the West Bank. Um, the impact is still being felt, at least indirectly, for including Euro Air Assistance. Describe a little bit about uh, that, how that, uh, how that works. You've conducted research called The Price of War, um, and for listeners who are interested in that, there are more in the show notes. So how do geopolitical shocks affect other economies? Right. If you look, if you if you look at wars, which are a realization really of geopolitical tension and risk, this is when things go bad, when it's mm. too late. Um, then you you can ask yourself, who really bears the cost of these wars? And first and foremost, and that's also what our research shows, it's obviously the uh, the country where the fighting takes place. And now currently in, in in Ukraine, the Ukrainians are really the Ukrainian economy is 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 bearing most of the cost and uh, historically if you look at major conflicts interstate wars uh, gdp that you know the, the the amount of goods and services produced shrinks by up to 30 percent uh, during a war um, but the interesting finding that we have and i think that's very relevant for for your listeners and for what's going on in the eurozone and for policymakers as well is that wars also if you will tax other countries that have nothing to do with the war, that are neutral third countries, that are um, um, you know bystanders, uh, in the sense that these this this economic shock, the uh, you know the decline in output in the on the war side spills over, especially into neighboring countries, and leads to lower uh, economic growth and higher inflation. And we see that quite clearly, for example, in the data for the eurozone or the euro area, I should say, and then the EU as a whole, that after the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and in, in the year following following the invasion, inflation rates, for example, were particularly high in, in the countries. Uh, being close to Ukraine and much lower in, in countries being far away. And that's a general pattern that we find that neighbors really uh, uh, bear the cost of these wars as well. This is an important point, and, and it came up in your panel discussion as well, um, that the biggest impact on the economy is where the fighting is taking place. So in the case of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, whereas Russia's economy has suffered or initially suffered from sanctions, that's not where the fighting is, not in Russia, and the economy has not fared so badly, correct? 
That's correct. Although I think we we have to uh, we have to give it time. We've there is sanctions on the Russian economy, and these sanctions are working, but they're not working overnight. They are you know they're imposing costs, and uh, various things have become much more expensive and much more difficult to produce for uh, for the Russian economy, and making it harder for the the regime in the Kremlin to to support the war effort. Uh, at the same time, and that's also a lesson from history. Um, that you can sustain these um, sort of militarily fueled uh, booms for a while. You just, uh, mm. you know, you dig up the iron ore, you smelt it into, into, into steel and make it into steel and produce weapons. That will fuel uh, the economy for a while. Obviously, the population suffers and consumption is way down and uh, all of your resources go into this war machine. Um, so it can't be sustained forever, but it's, I'm not so surprised that the Russian economy hasn't collapsed. Mm. Um, it's really, and it's a fact. Also, if you think about the, 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 you know, after after the end of this war, if you think about reparations, if you think about the costs and how to pay for them, it's 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 a fact that really Ukraine and also some neighboring countries, including Europe and those in the eurozone, are uh, have paid the price for that aggression. Hmm. And then um, action is required in some cases by central banks. This is partly about, isn't it, how long? the shock lasts because supply shocks central banks would normally look through. But we saw a big jump in energy prices here in the Eurozone and ultimately headline inflation, which required action. Right. So it's, it puts central banks in an uncomfortable position because these spillovers from armed conflict, from, from wars, are uh, negative supply shocks, meaning that they lower GDP, they lower growth, and they push up inflation. So there's an uncomfortable choice that central banks have to make between tolerating higher inflation or stabilizing growth and uh, accepting lower growth. And uh, according to our research, and that's, you know, this is this general uh, um, and patterns um, and then uh, from, from past conflict, these war shocks typically, they're not permanent. Economies bounce back when there's peace and, you know, when reconstruction gets going. But they last a few years, so they last longer than what central banks would typically be comfortable with in sort of looking through a shock. Mm -hmm. So you can, and to some extent, I guess, central banks also should uh, respond to these negative, to these adverse shocks with... Uh, with monetary policy because they have a chance to influence the economy. So in our research, for example, these shocks last four or five years. So that's a time frame where central banks mm. can respond. Coming back to this um, um, link between the um, impact of the geopolitical shock and the distance, if you like. I mean, for some countries, the furthest ones away, they can even benefit correctly. Yeah, that's a, that was a an interesting surprising result for us as well so i think it's quite intuitive once you start thinking about it so obviously neighboring countries and we know that from mm. the trade literature trade much more with each other there's mm. more similar the transport you know the transport uh, routes are well established it's, it's it's closer you can you can see that um, really the the amount of trade between two countries shrinks the further they are apart and now what happens when there's a war that the, the countries that are most hit immediately by the disruption of trade, by the destruction of capital and infrastructure, also the lower productivity in the war's economy. Imagine you, people can't do their regular jobs anymore. They have to go and fight. So that mm. is that is necessary and they have to do that, but they're not productive in the, in, in the same way as they were before. Um, so that shock that comes from the war side gets first and foremost transmitted to the neighboring countries because they trade a lot with each other. And then the further you go away, that adverse supply shock kind of decreases and eventually actually can turn positive because the trade that doesn't happen anymore between the neighbors then gets rerouted. And I think we've seen this, if you take the example of the Russian gas, that as part of that conflict was cut off and so European producers had to find different supplies and very often they turn to uh, to the United States and to mm. American liquefied natural gas. So, and then in that sense, uh, you can probably argue that for the US economy, um, being far away from the fighting, trading very little with Ukraine, but then being the country that European producers turn to for additional gas, uh, uh, was uh, actually had uh, has gained from that uh, conflict. Yeah. That's yes, extraordinary when you think about it. We talked a little bit about how central banks have to tackle the fallout here. Um, governments also need to think about it as well in terms of their um, economic 
um, resilience, if you like. And, and this is something that you've uh, talked about on the panel and that you've uh, mentioned in your research. What kind of resilience, what kind of measures do uh, countries have to take? That really connects uh, to what we talked about earlier, that we are now thinking very differently about globalization. So if you, if you look at, back at the motifs behind the globalization process, there were two promises. One was economic efficiency and growth, and I think globalization has fulfilled that. Mm -hmm. And there was a second promise, which was like if we trade more with each other, if our economies become more integrated, the world becomes a more peaceful and more stable place. And that second promise, to be honest, I think we have to confront the facts that the world isn't that much more stable, that much more peaceful than it used to be. So if trade integration doesn't necessarily pacify uh, international relations, then you want to make sure that you don't become too dependent in certain critical industries and certain raw materials, but also think about pharmaceuticals, antibiotics, uh, in, in, in areas that, are, that really matter to, to, to your economy or to your population, that you don't want to, be to become, uh, become too dependent on, call it countries that are not in your inner circle of friends. And that raises a whole agenda of economic security, of resilience, of being able to cope with um, being cut off from certain supplies and, uh, you know, maybe replacing uh, uh, certain uh, uh, trade inputs with domestic production. That's the idea of, you know, doing industrial policy in certain areas. Mm -hmm. There could be chips where we, where many countries are doing this now because they don't want to be dependent too much on, on, on one supplier that could be, uh, could be at risk of uh, being, um, uh, changing its, its, its uh, its ability to supply uh, these these chips on time, etc. So we really now think about the results of deep trade links, not only as a positive in terms of efficiency, but also as a potential risk in terms of dependencies and uh, choke points and ways that foreign powers could exploit their control over certain supply chains. And that is a big change in thinking about globalization. I mean, it, it's never going to be easy, and obviously you're not suggesting it is. You can build a chip factory. It's very expensive. It takes a long time, but you can do it. But rare earth materials, for example, are mostly in one location. It's China. Fossil fuels maybe can be replaced uh, over time by more renewables, but again, not easy, not cheap. I mean, it's quite a challenge, correct? Particularly on the commodity side. It is in, in, in various ways. Uh, number one is that some deposits that we have explored are in places of the world where, you know, as you said, um, we have uh, potential geopolitical rivals or they might also be in locations that are very, not very secure and where there's civil wars and, um, and where it's not, hard, not easy for us and not reliably possible for us to, uh, say, have access to lithium or graphite and all these things that we need for the for the climate transition and the electric vehicles and, and all of that. Um, the, other, the other problem is that the, it's not just the deposits, but the production and the refinement and the processing of these raw materials tends to be, let's face it, quite dirty. And neither Europe nor the United States, Canada or New Zealand or any of these countries are particularly keen on having lots of these highly polluting, highly dirty industries at home makes it also very expensive so we that also puts us in you know this is what economics is about deep down it's about mm. choices and trade-offs and you know we need to trade off supply security against the higher costs and including the environmental costs that this will bring i think the best way to think about this is that of an insurance it's we all used to buying insurance and paying insurance premium against bad things that might happen so that we're covered in the event of some event that, you know, we say like this might happen, might, we hope it might not happen ever, but in case it happens, it's, you know, we, it's, it's not the end of our personal finances, we can rebuild our houses or whatever. And what we're talking now about sort of geoeconomics and economic security, these agendas are very much like buying insurance. It's inefficient, of course, to build another chip factory where someone else can do it better and more efficiently we should trade but if you think about the possibility that these trade routes might not be secure that 
foreign powers might use or abuse that um, you know position in, in supply chains and not deliver the chips when we need them or not the gas or the energy or whatever uh, then you might say okay we're willing to pay a certain insurance premium um, do things to some things at home or reshore French or some of this production uh, but we have to pay a price and I think we have to prepare our populations that mm. we're throwing sand in the wheels of global trade and that will have a cost in some cases let me be frank I think making antibiotics a few cents more expensive seems like a very low cost to pay, low price to pay for having you know enough uh, uh, medication for our children in the winter, which is something that has come come up in in Europe in recent in recent years, time and again. Uh, in other cases, it will really be expensive, and we need to think hard whether we want to do that uh, and 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 go through with it. I was speaking to one central banker today about climate change and the challenges that uh, brings us, and he said he's a ultimately a techno optimist that these problems will be solved. Are you a geopolitical optimist, would you say? I, I do think, and I think that's a constant of modern history, it's much easier and you're much more right being optimistic about the progress of technology than about the progress of humans and peaceful relations and the potential we have to get along with each other. Okay. On that note, uh, thank you very much indeed. But before we wrap up, we always have a question that we ask all our guests on the podcast, which is for a hot tip linked to the topic we've been discussing today. Were you able to come up with one? Look, yes, I, I, I thought about this, obviously, and, and I think uh, it's, I think the, these geopolitical shifts that we're talking about are part of a broader shift in sort of the governance in democracies and their relationship to autocracies and their very worrisome tendencies also in in Western uh, democracies or European and, and American uh, elections coming up where some of the foundations that a lot of what we the sort of the operating system that we have including central bank independence all these things that we take for granted are actually much less secure than we for a long time thought they are um, something the crisis that we you know, diagnose in, in, in domestic or in Western societies is, is very real. And, um, and it's, it's something that we, we should uh, not lose sight when we debate, you know, all this, you mentioned the world technocratic issues of how to, how to uh, set certain economic policies and how to think about, uh, you know, trade and supply chain is a very abstract concept, but there, I think there's a very real um, a danger right now that uh, some of the democratic base on, on which our you know prosperity uh, post World War II was built is slipping, and so long story cut short, I very much recommend in that context um, um, reading on, and 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 look on hearing to the extent that's possible to, into uh, Martin Wolf's book uh, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism because I think it's it comes it goes really to, it's it's very readable and he's a great writer but it really goes to the heart of this moment where. You know, there are lots of challenges out there, but when do challenges turn into a crisis? Challenges turn into a crisis when the governance systems that we have are themselves in crisis and are not possibly not able or at least not perceived to be able to deal with these challenges. And I think that makes the current moment very, very dangerous and very um, important to, to understand. So that's my recommendation. And it's unfortunately not a cheerful note. <laughs> no, far from it. I've heard very good things about the book, though. So that's The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism by Martin Wolf. Uh, that brings us to the end of this episode. I want to thank you, Moritz Schulerich, who's president of the Kiel Institute for the World Economy, for joining the conversation here in Sintra at the ECB Forum on Central Banking. For those of you looking to hear more about some of the topics we discussed today, you can check out the show notes. There you'll see more of Moritz's research and to re-watch some of the discussions that took place at this forum. You've been listening to the ECB podcast with Paul Gordon. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe. Please leave us a review. And in the spirit of Europe, I'd like to end in Portuguese, of course, and say até a próxima. Until next time, thanks for listening.